This morning, I had been preparing a message on freedom and liberty. Uh, Thursday is July 4th, and everybody's getting ready for the barbecue. But the great price that was paid for us, not only nationally what happened here for us, but the greatest freedom that you and I have in Christ, what He has done, who He is, and who we are called to be. But with some of the events of this last week, my heart became very heavy and I began to ask the Lord for wisdom, for grace. And this morning we do something a little different and I'm going to share with you from my heart. And then I'm going to ask my brother-in-law, JP, to come up in just a bit. Because some of the things that have happened in our nation this week, the church just can't go, oh well. There has to be a response. And it has to be a biblical response. It cannot be a self-righteous response. It cannot be a Republican or a Democratic response. It must be a God response. So this morning, as we look at the Scriptures, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and I've titled the message, Don't Forget the Mission. Why are we here? Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. It says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Then Luke 19, 10, you don't have to turn there, but he says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And finally, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9, and this was Pastor J.P.'s text last week. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Father, this morning we need You. We need to hear Your heart, Your mind, and Lord, not to go on what we think is the right way, but to trust You to lead us. And the days and weeks and months ahead that the church will not lose its voice in the midst of all of the noise that we will speak very clearly very loudly the love and the grace of Christ to a broken and dysfunctional world bless our time in the word this morning we ask in Jesus name amen after the announcement was made on Wednesday of the decisions of the Supreme Court I watched the local news and the national news, and I got to tell you, it was bizarre. I was seeing stuff that I never thought I would see in my lifetime in our nation. And what I saw was those who were on the side that the Supreme Court sided with them were in celebration, and those who were on the side of Proposition 8 and the uh, Defense of Marriage Act automatically began to form their, their battle lines. And my concern is, if we're not careful, the church will choose a side, and either side will be the wrong side. We will miss what God is wanting to do. First, let me ask you this. Why should we be surprised at the, the, the things that are happening in this world when the Bible tells us very clearly that in the last days these things are going to happen? Doesn't the Bible tell us that in the last days men will become lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God? Lovers of themselves, proud, boasters, arrogant. Doesn't the Bible tell us that? But it's amazing to me, we know this, we understand this, yet automatically when we see it happen, instead of falling to our faces and crying out to God, God send us spiritual awakening, we get lawyers. We get lawyers and picket signs and we go stand on the corner and yell and scream. And, and listen, I believe the church is going to lose its voice to this culture if we keep going politically and not going spiritually. 
The church is the last hope. Jesus Christ came into the world to do what? To save sinners. When he said the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, that whole context of that, as he's walking down the road with his followers, and there's a wee little, we used to sing it in Sunday school, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree because the Lord he wanted to see. That's what was happening. Zacchaeus is up in the sycamore fig tree and he's looking. And as Jesus comes down the dirt road, he looks up and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. Today I'm going to your house. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Zacchaeus was a thief and a cheat. And that day the Lord said, he said, Lord, if I've wronged anybody, I'll give it back to them. I'll return any undue tax that I've collected. And the Lord said to him, he said, today salvation has come to your house. And this is the context of Luke 19.10. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. One of the things that I saw happening, I utilize social media. I use Facebook, Twitter, Hootsuite for influence. You'll be surprised how many of the unsaved, the unchurched will read what you post on there. So I say to you, young Christians, be careful what you post because other people who aren't saved are watching your posts. And they're judging the fruit of your life by what you say and how you respond. And immediately I saw well-intentioned, well-meaning believers begin to post things like, we'll never shop at JCPenney's or Macy's again. We won't ever go to Starbucks or use Amazon.com again because they support this agenda and not my agenda. Listen, you and I are in this world. We're not of it. And while we're living in this world, we are called to live in such a way that it attracts men and women to Jesus. And if we're always boycotting, if we're always tearing down, we're losing sight of the mission. One of the things, as I pondered my, my thoughts, and, and, I, and I sat for, for a long time just weighing this and reading the different articles and reading the decision of the Supreme Court, my heart was heavy because I saw a lot of Christian, well, I don't know if I would call them Christian, I saw well-intentioned people making bad decisions and using the name of God to do it. And I posted on Facebook, and I want to read to you my comments Let's be careful that our disgust and frustration with the court and our government's recent decisions does not manifest in our hearts as anger and hatred for the lost. As followers of Jesus, let us demonstrate the James 2.13 principle, mercy triumphs over judgment. Boycott, demonstrate, and isolate if you so choose. But do not let these words, and I quote, God hates unquote, come from your lips. God hates sin, not sinners. As for me and my house, we will live in this fallen world, living a life of holiness and doing our best to openly demonstrate the love of Christ. I will continue to drink Starbucks coffee and buy books on Amazon.com. And at the end of each day, hope and pray that I have freely given to others what I have freely received. God's mercy and grace. Is that compromise? No. Absolutely not. I, one well-intentioned pastor came on and busted me pretty hard. Called me timorous in the pulpit. You say, what is that? It means to be weak. It means to be compromising. It means to speak timidly. And I thought, well, apparently you haven't heard me preach in the last 30 years. And I said to him, I said, it's not a pulpit issue, it's a life issue. And I know right now through many of our minds, we're thinking, but pastor, God hates that. God hates homosexuality. No more than he hates adultery. No more than he hates pornography. No more than he hates gluttony. No more than he hates anything that we give ourselves to that we become enslaved to. You see, we, we've had for some time this holier-than-thou attitude that says, my sin is okay, but yours is not. 
The church has to move away from trying to lead in, in such a way as to make people conform to us. They will never conform to you and me. But if we live the mission and we show them the love of Christ, they will conform to his likeness and his image. Because we can speak grace with truth. And we can speak truth with grace. For Grace Community, what does this mean for us? I appreciated my brother-in-law's message last week on focus and dealing with the Great Commission. I believe one of the things that has to happen in the midst of this absolute chaos that's happening with our government and, and everything that's being said about our president, and we've already talked about that a few weeks ago, that you and I need to not be talking about him. We need to be praying for him and his family. We need to be interceding on their behalf. But also, we need to keep the mission at the front. We must be a missional church. To be missionally minded is to be focused individually as well as a congregation on being a tangible representation of the love of God to a broken and dysfunctional world. You and I, if we're standing with big signs that says God hates, the world doesn't see his love. They only see that we say he hates. When you and I correctly represent him and we demonstrate the grace of God and we live out the mission to see who we are and all that we do through the lens of the Missio Dei or the mission of God, it literally is to internalize the Great Commission and say, yes, God, I am going with the sole purpose of going into all the world to make disciples. Every person that I see that doesn't know you, I am in their life for one purpose alone, and that's to speak the love of God. You say, but pastor, we can't compromise. I'm not asking us to compromise. I'm saying we can't be judgmental. Remember the whole thing of sowing and reaping? If we sow judgment to a broken world, what are we going to get back? We're going to get judgment. One of my favorite stories in the Bible, and you know this, is of, of the woman caught in adultery. And I think the reason my heart leans so hard toward that story and it being so, meaning so much to me is when my family went through a divorce in the 70s. Divorce and remarriage was treated like the second unpardonable sin. My father had done nothing wrong, and I watched Assemblies of God preachers treat him like he had leprosy. Before that, my dad was the guitar player. He was on the platform. They had him teach. They had him speak. They had him teach Sunday school. But because divorce had come to our home, he was no longer worthy. And he had done nothing wrong. When I see this account of the woman caught in adultery, and they come and they, they bring her and throw them at Jesus' feet... And he's sitting there, and I don't know whether he's riding on the ground, what he's doing, and they say, Master, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Let me ask you this, how many does it take to commit adultery? Why was there only one person? I think it was one of the Pharisees. Had to be. Shh, don't tell him my stuff. Let's get her out there. The law says that we stone her to death. What do you say? He said nothing. Master, the law of Moses said, stone her. What do you say? The one of you without sin, you cast the first stone. Now listen, I have a very vivid imagination. In my mind, I, ha I have a word picture from reading this text. I have a picture of her laying at the feet of Jesus. Now, if you know somebody's getting ready to throw something at your head, what do you do? You cover it. In my mind's eye, I see her laying there with her arms over her head to protect her head. You see, because when they stoned somebody then, they didn't use a stone like this. The objective was to take a large stone, and the target was not the body, it was the head. The objective of stoning someone was not to bruise them and break them, it was to kill them. And in that moment when Jesus said, the one of you without sin, you cast the first stone, the stones began to drop. I'm sure she was anticipating the first strike, and she kept hearing them drop and felt no hit. And Jesus, 
I see him again. This is the way I read the story. I see him lift her up. And he says, woman, where are those who accuse you? And through her tear-stained eyes, possibly, she looked around and she saw none. And she said, there be none. And I love this. I love this. He says, neither do I condemn you. Why is that word neither so powerful? Because that day there was only one that could have thrown a stone. And the one who could, didn't. That's powerful to me. The one who could, the one who was completely justified and capable of throwing, did not. Church, you and I are at a place where at a crossroad in this culture that either we're going to become judgmental and harsh as the world perceives us to be, or we're going to come out of the four walls of this church with a message of life and hope, the good news of Jesus Christ, and that we are walking and living in his mission that he's called us to do. When we look back at the four verses of our text, we see that this is the heart of God. He would that none should perish. So he doesn't want the adulterer to perish. He doesn't want the fornicator, the drug addict, the the homosexual, the prostitute to perish. He's come that we might have life. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you right now, if it was possible, would want your past life flashed up here on this screen where everybody else could see it? Not this boy. Uh Uh-uh. Why? Because God has washed me clean. And I don't ever want to go back there and see that. And that's the message that we have for this broken and dysfunctional world, that Christ came into the world, and Jesus said it this way in John 14, 6, I am the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. But yeah, pastor, but they're corrupting our society. Then stop talking and start praying. It's amazing how many debates and arguments we will get into and so we're talking to men about men and nothing is changing. If the church would zip it as far as confrontation goes and we would go into our closet and begin to talk to God about men, I promise you he changes the heart of men and women still today. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts chapter 4 tells us that there's salvation in no other name other than the name of Jesus Christ. When the Philippian jailer asked Paul, said, what must we do to be saved? He said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Staying on mission and being missional is not about having a good missions program and giving to our missionaries. It is about keeping the focus. And listen to me. Be careful if you listen to talk radio. You will become a disciple of Glenn Beck or Rush Limbaugh or some liberal. And you and I need to be disciples of Jesus Christ. But I agree with them. I understand that. In principle, I agree with a lot of them. But when it comes to my theology and understanding who Christ is, I am submitted to him. Before I'm an American, before I'm a Marine veteran, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. And his word has the ultimate authority in your life and in mine. Before the Declaration of Penance, before the IRS Code, his word takes the supremacy. And the church has got to stop living as a political organization and start living as a living, breathing organism that has come here to communicate the life of Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor, you're not really speaking to the issue. I'm totally speaking to the issue. Again, we've made one sin bigger than the rest. But sin is sin is sin. When you read what Jesus says in the Revelation, when you read what Paul says in 1 Timothy about the things that will not be allowed into heaven, yes, he lists homosexuality, but he also lists adultery. He also lists lying. How many in here has never told a lie? I was hoping no hands went up because then we were going to have to give the altar call right then. (laughs) Listen. He says, gossip, 
gluttony, wine bibbers. You see, the American list or the Republican list or the Democratic list has been edited. You can't go by that list. We have to stand up on the authority of the scriptures. So what does that mean for us as a church? It means that the drug addict and the alcoholic is welcome here. It means that the adulterer, the fornicator, and the homosexual are welcome here. <gasps> really, pastor? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, when Paul was addressing this to one of the churches, he said, he lists these sins, and then he says this, and such were some of you. How many of us fit in that such were some of you category? Mm -hmm. This is a church that we say we're real people living real life, connecting families to the message of hope. If we're not careful, we will try to reinterpret what real means and it being raw. Well, I'm just speaking the truth. Listen, if you're speaking the truth and it's not in love, stop speaking. Hello? We're here to offer the aid and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ to a very broken world that needs it. I'm going to ask my brother-in-law, JP, to come. Keeping the focus, it's all about Christ. It's about you and me knowing Christ because knowing Christ is what makes us Christian. It's living this Christ life before this world that attracts them to us and to him. I've asked JP to come because he is actively involved in training people. He's a historian, uh, incredible knowing history and training people for ministry. I'm going to ask you an open-ended question, Pastor JP, and, and let's just have a little dialogue before we close in just a bit. The culture's taken a radical shift from where we used to be. As one who does know church history and you're training ministers, in your opinion, what do you see to be the church's greatest opportunity first? And then what do you see to be our greatest threat? Well, from my perspective, um, and this is, by the way, an issue that we're seeing more and more and more of. There has been, as you said, kind of a, an idea in the church that that when someone is involved with homosexuality that that is sort of you've gone past the tipping point for some in some way shape or form that the gospel no longer is applicable we see an ever increasing number of students who feel called to ministry who love god when we start to read their histories that part of their history whether it's just an isolated incident or whether it's an ongoing lifestyle uh, homosexuality has been a part of that and god is still saving people from sin right amen right and so my perception is that in some ways, uh, when things get dark, people who have the light get excited. And that's the perspective that we take at the school. One thing that we talk about when we talk specifically about this issue that often gets overlooked is if you read carefully and you know a little bit of the history of the Corinthian church, at the end, when he starts talking to people who've been involved with idol worship and he starts talking about how they've been delivered from worshiping mute idols and pagan gods, that there's some phrasing in there where he talks about men who before had worn veils and, and all these sorts of things. And we know that the pagan worship, specifically in the city of Corinth, was transgendered bisexual worship. And in some ways, what we have in the end of the first epistle to Corinth is an account of a church that has been birthed out of specifically a bisexual homosexual community. So God can do it. And we use that as our, as our starting place for the conversation of faith to say, look, God has done it before. No, there's no new thing under the sun. God is not surprised by our sin. From my perspective, it's an opportunity because you know when you sow to the wind, you reap the whirlwind. Right. And when we sow sin in our community, we're going to start to reap. And people are going to start to ask answers or ask for, ask, for, ask for answers. We probably have all had that with our children where we start to see them heading down a road and we know there's going to come a place where the consequence for what they're doing is going to come to pass, right? We've all seen that. Yeah. And, and we have to be there 
when they start to ask those sorts of questions. I think we as a community of faith and of grace have to posture ourselves and realize people will begin to reap the whirlwind. Mm -hmm. They will. The consequences of not obeying God because God didn't make up rules for no reason. He made them up because they work, because they please him and they work in our communities. They work the way he's designed humans to function together. And we need to be the people who are there and ready. But from a warning perspective, if I can draw on a historical analogy, um, during the beginning of the 19th century, so from 1800 till about eight, till the 1860s, the sort of issue of moral urgency in the United States was the issue of slavery. And the church felt very much the same way about slavery, the kind of range of passions as we today might feel about the issue of homosexuality. We sort of felt that is, may well be the defining issue for the church in our time. And in England, during the Great Awakening, we, I talked last week a little bit about John Wesley and George Whitefield. Out of that flowed, as God began to touch people's hearts, a desire to see slavery abolished, the abolitionist movement. How many have heard of William Wilberforce? Have you heard that name? Yeah. Who, who led to the abolition of slavery in Parliament in England in the early 19th century. In America, it lagged a little bit behind. And in the second Great Awakening, in the, in the first decade of the 1800s, after that, people's hearts began to be stirred for the abolition of slavery. And what happened as people's consciences were stirred, how do we undo this great sin, this great iniquity of our nation? People began to have a range of responses as believers. And initially, it started out pretty good. People started praying, which is a good idea when there is a serious moral urgency in the nation. People started having prayer meetings. They started using the press. They started preaching in a way that was zealous, but that was humble. But in 1837, a man named Elijah P. Lovejoy, who was a pastor, a Presbyterian minister, was shot. He was shot by people who were pro-slavery. And at that moment, a huge segment of the abolitionist church, the abolitionist people who were for the release of slaves, made a decision that the way of fulfilling God's will through prayer, through truth, through humility, through zeal was not enough. But they needed to take that into their own hands. And John Brown, if you know that name, was in Elijah P. Lovejoy's church, and he stood up the Sunday after Elijah P. Lovejoy was shot, and he said, I give my life this moment to the abolition of slavery. What he really said is, I've been consumed by bitterness. And in, 1850, in 1859, he did Harp, the rebellion at Harper's Ferry, and he went in and took armed people to take over that community and ended up being hung as a traitor. And that was a defining moment. I think we find ourselves at that defining moment. Will we say, this issue, me personally, will we, will we allow the truth of God to be a convenient way for us to become angry, for us to become zealous, for us to become bitter, for us to become self-righteous, and start to take into our hands the tools of the world? Or will we continue on the hard path of humility and patience, showing the gospel, telling the gospel? We talked about last night. You know when the church is the most powerful is when we speak the truth, that is uncompromising, but we also show uncompromising love. If we just show the truth, people have an off because they can say, well, they don't love. And if we just show the love, people have an off because they're not being exposed to truth. But I believe that the church, when we do both of those things, people literally, they get torn by our very presence. They're like, I love that person. I just can't stand it. I, I, I love going to Grace Community Church. It's like, I just feel so much love, but then that word comes and it just, they just should feel torn and conflicted. And that is the path that I think Christ really calls us to follow, where it's, it's radical truth, no compromised truth. But through the affection and the hugs and the high fives and the affirmation and the prayer and the care, they just can't tear themselves away from it. I said last night, it's kind of like the anesthetic that allows them to go through the operation of repentance when we allow love to take place. Good. And, and the, the surgery has to take place, but heaven forbid we do civil war surgery on people. Let's give them the anesthetic. Let's give them the love and the grace and walk through them, walk with them as they walk through repentance. So I think it's a great opportunity. And I'll just say one further thing. You mentioned the story, the very story I was thinking about, Zacchaeus. And of course, Matthew, one of the disciples, was also a tax collector. Mm -hmm. And they were the most hated, reviled people in the world at the time. I mean, they made their living by overcharging people for the government. The more they could charge you, the more money they make. I mean, I'm, 
you know, we don't like the IRS today. Even, it was 10 times worse. And if there was ever a time for the people of God to look at someone and say, you shouldn't love that guy, and they did. They said, he's hanging out with tax collectors. He's hanging out with the very people who are destroying our society. And Jesus basically says, you know what? That's what I came to do. Mm-hmm. It's hang out with the very worst of the worst of the worst. And I, I think this is the perfect time. I mean, we could probably freak some people out by taking the very people who are expecting hatred right now from the community of faith and inviting them over for dinner. I think we could just flat freak some people out for the gospel. And I think that's where we, where we need to be at. And that's how we're kind of posturing it with our students. This is, our, this is a great opportunity for us. God's done it before. He can do it again. Amen. You made a statement last week in your message um, that something about it is not our obstacle, it's our opportunity. That's right. We have an opportunity right now. As Pastor JP was saying about the history of the Corinthian church, here out of the midst of all of that immorality and pagan worship, people started getting saved and a church was birthed and righteousness began to be preached. What can happen if Grace Community literally becomes who we say our name, what we say our name is, a community of grace? Grace does not mean, and that's the the preacher that took the shot at me on Facebook. Some of you, thank you for your support, those of you who commented, and I appreciated that. But he, he said, that's the problem today. Too much grace, 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 grace. You know what? When I read in the scriptures, the words of Jesus, and it says, him that has been forgiven much does what? Loves much. I've been forgiven too much to try to stand as a judge over someone else. This church, as long as I am your lead pastor, we will not stand in judgment over people. We will restore the fallen. We will offer life to the broken and the hurting. You see, but what if when they stumble, we will help them get back up? How many of you have never messed up since you came to Christ? You've absolutely never messed up. Better not see any hands. We'll have another altar call. Because we've all blown it. That is a culture of grace that says, yes, we've all blown it. But there's mercy at the foot of the cross because there's coming a time when there will be no more mercy. And church, if you and I expect to receive, then what we sow is what we're going to reap. I want to reap an incredible harvest of mercy and forgiveness for this community. Amen. I'm going to close with this. A general superintendent who has his Juris Doctorate, uh, Dr. George Wood, he pastored at uh, Newport Mesa, got his law degree, and he wrote a great um, summary of what happened on Wednesday. And so if you want the legal aspect of what it could mean for us as a church, you need to read it. And I did. I read it, and I said, yeah, I could see this happening. But his last paragraph to me was the most powerful and profound. I want to read that to you. This is from Dr. Wood. He said, The decision today is a call to Christians to fervently pray and actively work for a great spiritual awakening in our land. God tells us what to do now. And he uses 2 Chronicles seven fourteen: If my people who were called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways that I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I believe that's our posture. I believe that has to be our posture as a church, as individuals. And I know that's why I can't sit and watch. I can't consume hours of the news. When I, Sherry will turn it on to, and she works around the house. She doesn't watch it. She just hey, has it on. And I know that the news cycle takes about 15 minutes to get through it. And after that, I'm done. Turn it off. Because if I leave it on and it keeps going over and over again, I started getting ticked off. You know, you, you know the old redneck saying, you can't fix stupid? That's the first thing that comes to my mind. 
And I go, my natural man starts coming up, and that's not the guy that needs to be here. That natural way of thinking, that natural way of dealing with the culture is not the one because I've been made new in Christ. That's the guy that needs to be talking. That's the guy that needs to be living out this life. I know we've put a lot on you this morning. But I want you to know what kind of church you attend. You see, again, I remember what they did to my father and my mother. I've watched what the church has done when a a little girl got pregnant out of wedlock. Where they were treated like dirt. I've been forgiven of so much. And because I've been forgiven of so much, I love so much. And that's the kind of church grace community has to be. Brother Norris, would you come? Father, we thank you for your grace. God, we thank you that mercy has been extended to us. And God, right now, I repent on behalf of all churches before this body. If there's someone in this building that's been hurt by a church or a Christian, a pastor, and because of that, they've put up walls God, today I repent on their behalf. And I ask that your healing power begin to flow through this room. God, if there's one sitting here today that says, I'll never give my life to Christ because of what I've seen and experienced that today that they sent your mercy. For the follower of Jesus who's been at a distance for some time but allowed their heart to get hard or cold. This morning, let your healing power flow. Minister, we pray. Would you stand to your feet with me just for a moment? I'm going to ask us as a church to take a step this morning. I don't want to be like every other church in the city. I don't want to be like every synagogue or... I'm asking God to do with us what He wants. And that we are giving grace and mercy as we've received it. But you know, I can't do it by myself. It takes a community. I wonder if you would say, Pastor, that's the kind of church I'm a part of and that's what I want to be a part of. I want to do this. And I know God has a work to do inside of me. If you'd say, that's the kind of church we're going to be, I agree with you, Pastor. Would you come and join me at this altar? We're going to stand here. We're going to pray together. We're going to agree together in Jesus' name that he's going to use us this way. Listen, I really hope that every person in this building makes their way down here because that's the kind of church we want to be. He said, well, Pastor, I don't come to this church too often. Come on anyway. We want you to be a part. Hallelujah. 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 God, this morning we stand here as imperfect people. If we had to unpack all of our spiritual and physical and emotional garbage, this building couldn't contain it. And that's just mine. Today we come as a group of believers and say, Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We say yes to you and the mission that you have for us. We will love this city. 
we will love our neighbors. We will demonstrate your grace in such a powerful way. And God, as you begin to bring people into our lives and into this place, we say, yes, Lord, use us. Use us to touch Whittier and the surrounding areas. Use us greatly. And God, as we're standing here again, I pray for healing. I pray for restoration. God, whatever we have been through, that your hand begins to rest down today. God, we're not surprised by the decisions of our government. And yes, we're grieved in our hearts. But we know who we serve. And we will be victorious as we live for you and we love for you. Be with us now. Let your healing power flow, your life-giving power. In Jesus' name, amen. Now look up here. Guess what? You're going to get tested today. Today, before you get home possibly, you're going to get tested. Remember, mercy triumphs over judgment. What you sow, what you plant is what's going to grow. This is a church of grace, a community of grace. I love you. Now we got to live it out. And I'm telling you, how many of you, I know some of you, your excuse is that you're Mexican, some of you that you're Argentinian or Italian. Mine's, I'm a redneck. <laughs> and it just shows up. But I'm so glad that the grace of God supersedes my genealogy, my upbringing. The grace of God supersedes it all. That's what we want to take out of this building. Amen. I love you. I thank God for you. Be praying for the city. Be praying for our government. Pastor JP, thanks for being with us these two Sundays. Appreciate you. God bless you. Leave this place. Greet someone before you leave.